Support for Clever comes from Design Museum Magazine. We want to let you know about a new must-have design magazine. Design Museum Magazine is a quarterly print and digital publication about design impact. Each issue contains stories from creative thought leaders on how they're using design to change the world. Stories like Turning the Inside Out, The Workplace Meets Mother Nature by Lee Stringer. And interviews with design leaders like Kat Holmes, Director of UX Design at Google, and the late Phil Freelon, Design Director at Perkins & Well Architects. Design Museum Magazine is design inspiration you can hold in your hands. Visit designmuseummagazine.org to subscribe today. The new discovery for me was that the whole kind of dimension or process that came before the making, all the decision making, the, you know, the, the working something out, the real creative process. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers and this is Clever. Today I'm talking to famed industrial designer Konstantin Gurcic. Born in 1965, he grew up in Germany during the 70s, then headed to England where he trained in cabinet making at the John Makepeace School for Craftsmen and Wood, before studying design at the Royal College of Art. He started his design studio in 1991, and since then has designed several iconic and enduring pieces with noteworthy clients like Flos, Magis, Muji, Vitra, and many others. He's won too many international design awards to list here, and his work is in the permanent collections of New York MoMA and the Pompidou in Paris, among others. I'm a big fan of his work, so I was particularly excited to learn that he also grew up appreciating punk rock. Here's Constantine. My name is Konstantin Gürcic. I'm uh, based in Berlin, where I live and work. A designer, running my own studio since more than 25 years. I became a designer because I love things and I love understanding how things work. And, and that led me to actually designing, making these things. And that's how I started. And that's what I, I'm still more or less doing today. Even though many things have changed, <laughs> in, <laughs> yeah, the world keeps century, changing. But yes, but well, the problem is you keep designing the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we always like to go back to the very beginning to help us get a sense of what your beginnings were like and how you became who you are. So, can you tell me about your hometown, where you grew up, what your family dynamic was like, and kind of paint the picture of your childhood for us? So I'm, I'm the second child of two. I have a, um, a one-year-older sister. Um, we grew up in, in Germany. My mother, German, and my father from ex-Yugoslavia, the Serbian part. And we grew up in, um, in different cities in Germany, um, West Germany, that is. Uh, I was born in Munich, uh, but raised mainly in a, a, a city called Wuppertal, which is not very well known, but it's a, it's a very industrial city. It kind of, the industry is a textile industry and, and chem chemical industry and textile industry. Mm. Uh, in Germany, people joke about uh, Wuppertal being a, a rather ugly city, which is not true. <laughs> when you come from there, um, it's a city that is very lovable. You can find a beauty in, in the ugliness and, and certainly the beauties in the people. That, yes. that live there. Um, so that's where I, I, I grew up. This is a, really the center of Germany. In the, um, I was born in 65, so I, I grew up in the 70s. As a kid uh, or a teenager, um, those were the years of still punk rock uh, that um, I listened to and, and that in, informed the, these kind of um, very important years, teenage years, I I wanted yeah. to go to what England. kind of punk rock were you listening to? Like international or very oh, German? No, it, well, actually <laughs> international. But there was a very um, vibrant um, a scene in Germany and 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 quite in the in in Wuppertal, in fact, and Cologne, which is nearby, Düsseldorf. Yeah, so there were some German bands uh, at the time, Fehlfarben being one of them. 
that mm-hmm. I liked and listened to, and they came from Wuppertal. But uh, it was uh, it was a lot of the, all the, the the British bands at the time. American punk rock I, I discovered much later, but uh, also good. That's a very important clue, I think, to your design aesthetic. But we'll get there. Mm. <laughs> In your adolescent years, is, is punk rock how you were expressing yourself? And were you were you playing instruments, or were you just feeling like like you needed to push against the establishment in some way? So I, I don't play an instrument, and therefore I was never part of a band um, <laughs> or, mm-hmm. or that that scene. Um, what I like about punk rock was not even so much the you know being against the establishment but a form of expression and that is very direct no compromise uh, straight to the point uh, short <laughs> loud maybe mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. i don't want to make um, the, the kind of direct connections between that and and, and what have, has become my work mm-hmm. but I still think that, you know, simplicity is something that really um, goes, you know, through my work as a, as a, as a red thread and simplicity, directness, uh, being radical, meaning really going to the roots of things. That was probably something that I picked up listening to punk rock and, and, and liking that scene and this culture and, and form of expression at the time. And were you dressing the part and consuming the the social elements of the punk rock scene as well? Not, not to an extreme. So I, I, there, there are no photographs of me being a, a total <laughs> um, <laughs> head to toe punk rocker. But, but of course, there were there were codes um, of uh, you know dress codes and hairstyle, and that I, I I followed very closely. And I was you know I, I definitely had my style uh, and that was a conviction that you know I had to be a certain way I was not the the, the kind of the most colorful um, <laughs> <laughs> of punks I also am a devotee of punk rock and I remember for me personally there was something very cathartic about mm-hmm. that 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 direct honest expression that you're talking about but yeah. also with that emotional catalyst mm-hmm. to it like there mm-hmm. was a a willingness to to not only say it directly and honestly, but to to almost scream it, yeah, and to underscore its importance. Yes, that that movement was driven by a certain urgency. They, they yeah. I mean, they needed and and wanted to, like you say, go against the establishment and and express that. From my upbringing, I was not in that position to to have to fight uh, against something, um, you know, with that urgency. But I think that you know, if we speak about how that has informed my my work as a designer, I feel you know everything I do, I I I am looking for an urgency in in why I'm doing something, and also you know, by choosing the means of of doing it. I, I think it's urgency is, is actually is something very positive it, it it makes you really want something and and that brings you to you know radical in the sense of really going to the core of things trying to to do something in a, in a very essential way so from from punk rock in your small town <laughs> to studying woodworking at John Makepeace School for Craftsmen how did you arrive at that decision? Well, first of all, I finished school in, in Germany. We, we finished school by the age of, I think I was 19. Uh, mm. And I didn't have to go to the army because I didn't have a German passport at that time. So I was, I was, I was not like my friends that had to either do social service or, or go to the army. I was um, free to do what I wanted after school. But what did I want to do? One thing I knew for sure, I didn't want to go back to school. I I was so kind of relieved leaving school that that was, that would have been, you know, an impossible thought. So um, I I definitely didn't want to study. That means, Um, and I, I wanted to do something physical, practical, do something with my hands My dream was uh, building boats and there's no explanation why, you know, I had that dream because um, I I never lived anywhere near water. I'm not a sailor. I (laughs) 
<laughs> but from when I was a boy, I, I had a fascination with this thing that is swimming on water, a boat. Like maybe others, um, you know, they, they, they love planes. I love, I love boats and I wanted to build boats. And I was looking for an apprenticeship as a boat builder uh, when, I, when I left school. And I couldn't find one. I, I traveled, you know, I was ready to, to move uh, wherever somebody would offer me such a job. But at that time, nobody did. It was quite frustrating for me. I, I just said that, you know, I was, I was, you know, leaving school, I was ready to do what I wanted to do. And, but the first um, experience was that I wasn't let to do what I wanted to do. I ended up working uh, for a furniture restorer. That was the, the nearest possible, you know, job I could find. And I stayed there for a year and it was really not what I wanted to do. But I have to say now in retrospect, I learned an awful lot there. And, and it mm -hmm. probably was the, the, the kind of experience that made me discover furniture, which I hadn't uh, really taken any notice of before. Mm -hmm. But restoring um, antique furniture brought me to furniture. And I'm more or less still doing furniture uh, today. But what, what I, I knew was that I didn't want to repair or, or, or polish up old furniture, but, but make new furniture. Um, so after that one year uh, working mm -hmm. for the furniture restorer, I, I wanted to do an, a, a, a formal apprenticeship, um, learning the, the real craft of cabinet making. And it was through a friend of mine that I, I heard about John Makepeace, the John Makepeace School in the southwest of England. And that just sounded perfect for me because England was, you know, now coming back to punk rock and all, all, <laughs> all you know, that time, I, you know, England was the a, a, a country that I, I, I had traveled to before and I, I loved. Mm -hmm. And so it sounded great going to England, um, to, you know, for, for this apprenticeship. Obviously, it wasn't London or any any big city, but it was really in the countryside, in the in three and a half hours uh, away from London. And I found myself in a very small community of people working in these workshops. When I decided to go there, I wasn't aware what I was letting myself into, but it was again a discovery of something that would change my life, you know, in a, in a very positive way or in in a, in a way that I'm I'm really grateful for. John Makepeace is a, a master craftsman in the tradition of the arts and crafts movement in England. Mm -hmm. um, a personality in craft that in, in Germany, we don't have this. In Germany, craftsmanship has become something very um, academic in a way, f f very formal. Uh, in England, uh, it's still connected to real personalities, people like John Makepeace that are almost artists, they are individuals um, mm -hmm. that have developed their craft, but in, in a very individual way, and obviously in a very creative way. And that, that became a role model, um, showing me just, on the one hand, of course, there was the education of, you know, skills, learning the skills, but then what you do with that skills is up to you. You decide yes. how you apply these skills. And it was, I think, at, at that time in these, uh, this was a, a two-year um, apprenticeship, we didn't really ever speak about design, but I feel that it was all about design, or later on I realized it was all about design, because if design is, you know, asking questions about what it is you, you, you want to do and, and how and uh, with what kind of resources and means and uh, mm -hmm. Which, it was, it, asking questions about the utility and the, the purpose and the, the, the utility, life cycle. the purpose, the life cycle. Of course, there's, it's also about you know design in the sense of giving form to something. But it, it came from that. That was a consequence of so many other questions and that kind of uh, a whole process leading to something that has a, a particular form. I really enjoyed that, and I decided then that. I want to do more of of this planning, developing ideas rather than the making. I, I enjoyed the making very much. That's why I went there. Mm -hmm. um, but the new discovery for me was that the whole kind of 
dimension or process that came before the making, all the decision making, the you know, yeah. the working something out, the real creative process. And I decided to I, that I I wanted to go and study uh, design. Um, and since I was already in England, I was um, the natural next step was applying to the Royal College of Art, a postgraduate course um, in in London. We couldn't do this show without our sponsors, so show them some love. We'll be right back in a minute. Support for Clever comes from Lulu in Georgia. If you're like me, you're constantly in the mood to refresh your home, and I'm loving the elevated essentials and decor from Lulu in Georgia. They've got everything to make your dream home a reality, from rugs and furniture to lighting and accessories, plus exclusive collaborations like the best-selling rug and pillow collection with designer Sarah Sherman Samuel. Right now, I am coveting their Amir Moroccan shag rug in gold. It would make my living room so magical. Visit luluandgeorgia.com slash clever and use coupon code CLEVER15 for 15% off your next purchase. That's luluandgeorgia.com slash clever. Did you find that your two years at the John Makepeace School for Craftsmen also unlocked a connection between your brain and your hands in a certain way that also brought it back to the thinking that happens before anything even gets built, which is the design process? Yeah. And then, of course, it led you to Royal College of Art. But do you feel like your time there also helped you establish a sort of understanding of materiality in a way that served you in your design school? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I mean, learning a craft, and that could be any craft, whether it's woodwork or metalwork or a, become a car mechanic, I think um, learning a craft is is learning something from from the ground up and uh, mm -hmm. and learning something by doing and by understanding the logic of things. And what, what I, I know today, I, it has – it has helped me it is still helping me to adapt to all other uh, materials techniques machinery tools um, mm -hmm. understanding the whole process of uh, what it means to produce something that and and that could uh, even on an industrial scale uh, or in the in the kind of on the small scale one-off or prototype making or batch production and uh, this really is is an understanding I, i i got from these two years at the john makepeace school mm -hmm. and it's more than that for, for me th those two years were the most important in my in my education i feel my growing up from being you know a teenager a kid not really knowing what i wanted to do to becoming more mature in in my understanding of my own life what i wanted to do and how i could actually achieve that and it it really installed in me a, an attitude of mind um, and that is an attitude of mind that i started to understand what work means because i i in my school life i never understood what that really meant and it was you know part of my problem in school that nobody taught me how to work properly it's a gift to you know to understand that and actually enjoy it, enjoy yeah. that um and it, it kind of makes so many things more easy and clear and like i said enjoyable yeah it sounds like you really sort of opened up to your own sense of personal agency yeah absolutely i mean two years is a very short time but because it was such a small community of people um and all quite like-minded in in the sense everybody was kind of <laughs> therefore came there because of the the work because of the quality of work and and we were all kind of in our, all in our own way um, focused something and then the experience at the royal college was <laughs> kind of because the the royal college in a way the royal college is a myth and it it's to me it sounded like the the next step up um even you know even better than mm -hmm. john makepeace and Uh, I'd say it was then rather disappointing. The the Royal College of Art was at that time not a good school. Um, What time are we talking about? Uh, this is the early 90s. Um, mm -hmm. 
It was a great place, uh, and I think that's what saved me. It was a, a you know for me then it was great to be in London and at the Royal College. You, you know there were so many other great people, um, mm-hmm. other students, also interesting teachers coming, passing through London and giving lectures or guest tutorials and so on. That's what what was great uh, about the Royal College, and 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 they, were, they had a fantastic library. Uh, I, I think I spent probably half my time at the Royal College sitting in the library and discovering uh, and kind of making up for my lack of knowledge in design and, and just studying design through books. But in terms of the teaching, really, and probably also in in terms of what did I actually achieve there, what did I make, uh, I think it was nothing, it wasn't very special, it wasn't very productive. But then, in a way, that almost sparked this, and now I'm going to say urgency for me to get out and and, and kind of find that energy again that I had leaving John Makepeace and and this kind of also, if you want, a a form of confidence that, you know, I had, you know, about my own work and my own way of doing the work. No, I can, this totally makes sense because I sort of found a sense of my own agency and community that really seemed to parallel what I responded to in the punk rock mu- movement when I found a small community of craftspeople who were mm. making furniture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there was a, a tremendous power in, I mean, obviously, it was at a critical time for you because you were going from being a, a teenager to an adult, and that's a very <laughs> formative time. But to be able to do that with a community, a small community of people who are driven and opening up in the same way, and you're accessing power you didn't have before, both to manipulate materials, but to think about you know how you can shape your own life and how yeah. the world is built. And then it sounds like at Royal College of Art, it galvanized the idea that you have to be proactive about your own education and about finding that that thread of urgency or importance that's going to keep you energized and yeah. moving through. Exactly. And I, I think that you, you, you put it um, perfectly because I, I think really the, the main thing I got out of the Royal College was the, the you know, understanding that, uh, you know, it's, it's up to me. Um, yeah. No, nobody will, you know, there, there's nobody, you know, to, to, to hold my hand. Um, and and I, in, in a way, I didn't want that um, anyway, but um, it was up to me to make things happen and to take things and in, in my own responsibility. Um, to be fair, I, th- there were good people at the Royal College. Um, Jasper Morrison uh, was there as a teacher. He, he was an ex-graduate from the Royal College and uh, still a very young designer at that time. Uh, and he came into the Royal College. He was one of my, my teachers uh, and I learned so much from him. Also, Vico Magistretti, one of the great Italian masters, mm-hmm. um, who I, I guess it was those two that became real role models. Are very different. Um, one, yes. you know, being being probably in his seventies, uh, and and you know, someone who had built his career in, in very different circumstances. And the other one, I think Jasper is uh, six, seven years older than I am, and um, you know, someone who has just set up his own studio and making his way. And so I had these a, a very close experience, very personal experience of these two perspectives, and and that really encouraged me, helped me through the two years at the Royal College, and 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 encouraged me in setting up my own practice straight after after leaving. That's what I was curious about. What did you do after graduation? Did you go straight into? For a short while, I worked for Jasper Morris, and that was um, because he had a he had a job and he needed some help, and I, it was good for me to do that. But then I set up my own office, and and that now I'm talking about 1991. 1991 is kind of a, a phone, a fax machine, a drawing mm-hmm. board, a tiny, <laughs> tiny little computer, the a kind of 
a Macintosh classic, which is a, a typewriter um, and not for tracing drawing. paper. Um, tracing, otherwise marker. tracing paper, um, and so it was easy in a way to set up your own office, and uh, life was kind of, uh, I'd say, rather simple, and with very little you could get by. Uh, and that was my calculation. I had this kind of number of now there's euros at the time it was still a, a different currency, a German currency, um, and um, with just one thousand Deutschmark, uh, which is something like five hundred euros, I could um, live a whole month. So I had to wow. earn five hundred euros a month to go to get by, uh, and that made it fairly easy people sometimes ask me just you know how you know courageous that is to set up your own thing and it must have been difficult i think at the beginning was not difficult it became difficult uh, just probably four or five years later when you know then you start to be more established or projects become more difficult you have more responsibilities you, uh, everything Larger becomes scale. More, yes, yeah d- yeah um so qu- a quick logistic question since you studied in england and you moved back to munich to, right you started your studio that's in right munich. yeah yeah do you feel a disconnect from let's say the the creative contacts and the professional contacts and community that you'd established in in school and how did you yeah. start to get clients and how did you feel like you had enough business acumen to to cover all the entrepreneurial aspects of running your studio? Well, I I, I have to cut this um, story very short, but I okay. it, it wasn't my choice to go back to Germany. I wanted to stay in England, but um, I had mentioned before that at the time I, I didn't have a a German passport. The fact is, I, I did not have a, a passport of the European community at the time, which meant that I, I wasn't allowed to stay in the UK. Oh. Um, that's what made me go back to Germany. And at the time, the UK was going straight into a deep recession. So okay. all my friends, colleagues from, from college, they they all had a hard time finding jobs uh, and that probably um, made it a little easy for me to to pack my things go back to germany mm-hmm. where things were <laughs> kind of uh, com- comparatively um, good um, economically <laughs> and of course i had you know you know connections i, I had a network of people i knew in, in germany it, it was in fact a, a german friend from london had just moved back to munich he was an architect. He set up his office. Uh, I rented a desk inside his office. That was my first office. Um, so again, yeah, perfect. And and like I said, quite easy. And just, I, I didn't have a, a business plan. I didn't have a, a, a great strategy. I just wanted to do my own thing. And it was fine to do that on a very small scale. Uh, and mm-hmm. that small scale would kind of mean that I, I I stayed very independent and there was no pressure to do projects that I didn't want to do. It's just so different today, I guess, for anyone who's leaving college today. The, the kind of privilege back then, 30 years ago, was that, you know, life was quite simple. And that mm. allowed me to do things, start, start um, you know, with doing very very small little steps <laughs> uh, and and learning by doing because you know when you when you leave college and and start your own thing you have no idea oh yeah each project is is a learning curve each project is a learning curve and and what it actually means to run an, an office and to do business in um kind of quotation marks uh, that was uh, no nobody had had shown me but but i i you know i had time to learn that in an in a kind of soft way. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite grateful for that. <laughs> yes, I can, I can hear it in your voice that you're, you're grateful for that. But it, it also is a different time now. Yes. Um, yeah. Things happen at a different Absolutely. pace and there are different pressures. But looking back over the 25 years that you've been doing this, there are a number of pretty pretty prominent projects out there with your name on them. I wonder if 
you can talk about some of the the projects or the pieces that have the most meaning to you personally or or even which ones mm. that fostered your personal growth in the most impactful ways all of these projects um, are are connected to people um, because what I realized is that doing my work I need a, a partner or client or producer or you know whatever mm. I could say I've been lucky or I could say I, I've had a good kind of instinct for finding the right people at the right time, people that I could trust. And mm. I, 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 I had a lot of trust and I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't kind of starting my business and, and feeling, you know, this is a, a scary world out there. I, I thought it was, you know, here I am, I want to, I want to do work, and and I was I w I had a trust in in that you know out there there were good people that could help me or enable uh, projects. And one of the 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 kind of really important people was a, a guy I met. Somebody introduced me to this guy who had a company producing plastic everyday life plastic products. Uh, waste bins, um, soap dishes, toothbrushes, uh -huh. <laughs> um, drinking cups, little things. But they were very well designed, uh, well designed in the sense that they were very simple, nice objects made of an interesting quality of plastic, polypropylene with the translucency that was something new or different at the time. This guy was producing in Italy and China on a really industrial scale. That was definitely my dream as a, as a you know, I, I called myself an industrial designer, you know, without any experience as an industrial designer, but that's what, where I wanted to be working mm -hmm. for industry. And so this man, um, Hans-Jörg Meyer Eichen, uh, opened that door for me because these projects were simple he just, he felt I could do that. I designed a waste paper bin in plastics uh, after a year and a half being out on my own. And um, again, I would say it was rather simple, easy. <laughs> it just uh, took me into a new kind of sphere or onto another level of, um, it was super exciting. The fact that, you know, they would make it tool and you know make an investment into a tool and then these things came out of a machine uh, you know every whatever 30 seconds and and they cost they were really affordable it was a nice product that i i, I could relate to it, it, it belonged to my life um, and i could i designed it to go out there in the, into the world i think it gave me a lot of confidence that you know from my background as you know from woodworking and then doing projects at the Royal College that I was never really comfortable with, student, the typical student type products, projects. Suddenly I, w I, I had kind of arrived or, or landed in, in this kind of, in this real world uh, of uh, industrial design. And it wasn't all difficult. It was, it was kind of um, easy or uh, feasible. Uh, doable for me and uh, so that that I, th I think gave me a real push i guess then what are the other stepping stones i think the mayday lamp uh, for floss probably now we are in my fifth year uh, being being um, you know running my own practice i designed this lamp which was a very very personal product i would say still today i feel this is a lamp i, I really designed for myself but it became successful and and you know all these projects do something they add a little bit of i don't know experience but being young <laughs> what you really need is you um, confidence and just feeling you know, encouragement that you're doing the right thing and yeah that's such a long way doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i would say the my the the waste paper bin that i was talking about was still a very you know that's a, a very industrial product everyday life product not a product where you put a lot of person you don't put a lot of personality into this thing but the mayday lamp i think had 
this element of you know it was that was it was my story this lamp what i wanted it to be and the fact that that actually made it uh, be, became a commercial success in the sense that other people would feel oh yeah i understand that lamp um and i know how to use it i know what to do with it i i know where to put it um because why i designed that lamp was not only my own personal scenario but actually a lot of people had similar needs or use for for such a lamp and and uh, mm -hmm. i think that was um, therefore quite nice um, and that was an italian company uh, maybe i should add uh, floss is an italian lighting company and my all my heroes designers that i looked up to and the whole of my when i said in at the royal college of art i i kind of studied all the, the history of modern design for me the most important history of modern design the one that i could relate to it was all in it all happened in italy so for me um being able to work with an italian manufacturer and uh, was was also a dream come true um, and i guess then from there it moved quite quickly then working for one italian company you become visible for other italian companies and they call you and ask you to work with them and so on and it's You know, I, I mentioned before that if the first years were very simple um, and easy, I'd say around that time it became more complicated. And of course, I, I made mistakes choosing maybe the wrong companies that I worked with. And I, I made mistakes or I made also the odd bad experience and had to kind of reverse a certain decisions. And um, But... All of that was necessary, of course. You also learn from mistakes. Um, yes, mis mistakes are important teachers. Um, yeah. Can you give me a sort of a snapshot of what your practice looks like today? Because, I mean, you're firmly established in the world of design, world renowned, we could call you. You have the luxury, I assume, of choosing the projects that have the most appeal to you. So, mm. what types of projects do you gravitate towards these days? Well, first of all, I would say I, I have the um, the luxury of choosing to stay small as a studio. I knew that it would only this whole thing would only work for me if I stayed small. Uh, I could have grown over the years, um, but expanding would have meant that I end up not designing but managing a, an office of people. Uh, I want to design things. Uh, that's why I'm a designer and, and that's why I stayed small. And as mm -hmm. a small office and kind of, like you say, renowned or with a certain, you know, we have a certain name in the, in the, in the industry. Uh, yes, I can choose projects, but also I have to choose projects. I, we, because simply we cannot do more than our capacity allows. Um, my, my studio is, uh, there's five of us all together. Um, that's myself three designers of, uh, and, and uh, a studio kind of manager. Uh, this small team, we, we can only do a certain amount of projects and I, um, that's why I, I have to be choosy <laughs> about, uh, <laughs> and selective about um, projects. Also, of course, it's a, it's a kind of privilege being able to pick just the, the ones that uh, you know, interest me most or as we are working with With clients, a lot of my client relationships are very long term. I've, I, I'm, I have a, a, quite a few companies that I work with for way over 10 years. And, and uh, I, I feel, you know, we will <laughs> probably be working for another 10 years um, as, as partners. And that allows me to, uh, to say no to a lot of, you know, to, the, to some of the, you know, companies that approach me. And those long-term relationships are wonderful because you've already built the trust and established the shorthand communication. And yes. you really get to dive deeper, I you, think, you get, once you've gotten through that. Exactly. You get, you, it becomes a very personal relationship. You know each other. You know what you know how, how the chemistry works, how, the, how the, the whole kind of logistics of it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you trust uh, each other because you've gone through you know, the ups and downs uh, with every project. 
but it also means that you know every next project kind of builds on what you've done before it's not going back to square one um but yes. but you yeah, you, you pick up on where you've kind of left it with the, the previous project and it becomes its own story within the company uh, i think again the, uh, the 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 kind of if you look at the history of of design and the great masters and their most important projects you will see that a lot of them these good projects by the good people they did them for the same clients because mm. there was this this kind of the this close relationship this close dialogue and intensity and not uh, you know real knowing each other it's i, I think Design is such a it's a difficult discipline. It's not easy. Um, we we speak about you know how how much fun it is and it's enjoyable and so on. Yes, it is, but um, it's also really hard work. It needs the right environment and the right conditions and circumstances and 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 of course the the team. And that's what these a, a long term relationship with a client uh, uh, what, what that provides. I think that there is a through line also from the honesty, emotional urgency, and the sort of chaotic and disruptive elements of punk rock that show hmm. up in your design work. And I think that's really powerful. I, it's obviously not a direct interpretation, but there is an element of chaos and disruption and humor and urgency mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you've been able to protect. I want to say, mm -hmm. from getting distilled out of your projects. And that in itself, I think, is rebellious and disruptive, but also I think it's pretty badass, for lack of a, of a more <laughs> eloquent way <laughs> of describing it. <laughs> and I wonder if these relationships are part of how you're able to do that, or if you mm. have just been uncompromising, or if you have anything to say about how you've been able to protect those elements of your design work from getting distilled out into sort of a market-driven consensus project. Well, I think a, a bit of both. I'm I'm uncompromising because I I I just know myself uh, well enough to know that it doesn't work for me if I if I start making compromises. I I lose I look I lose touch with what I'm doing. It's work, which means so much to me because it's it's my passion and and my life um, begins mm -hmm. to kind of slip out of my hands and mind and, and kind of um, so I, I need to it's, it's a self-discipline protecting this each project as you know staying really close to me and that means um, uncompromising but um, true also that uh, I can only do that because I'm I, I have partners in these really good clients that I've been working with for a long time that have become friends some of them they are definitely mentors in in a way but because i've, I've been you know I've, I've been learning from them and through them they enable me to do things and you know I, I feel that has helped and i i don't know um you know how do you find these people it's you have to bring the, the kind of trust into this relationship Mm -hmm. But also an instinct or the, it's it's about, you know, listening to the kind of chemistry. I think most important for, you know, choosing projects or, you know, deciding I'm, I'm going to do this project or not this uh, or not is is a decision you make. It, it's about, you know, the people I've, I've said no to projects that were interesting, but I, I felt that, uh, you know, the people involved, um, it, it wouldn't have worked for me. I, I find myself doing projects that, you know, uh, I'm almost, I, I'm doing, don't get me wrong, if I say uh, out of a favor for people, because I, some of these people, I, I, I love them so much that it's, it's, I enjoy it so much working with them. I, I do projects even that are no, not the most urgent. I have to <laughs> admit that also. But uh, in, in, in the long run, I, I always feel that's still the better way. Working with, with people you like, you, you you enjoy uh, working with and spend and then you know beyond work spending time with that's what matters most
Mm-hmm. And being able to align on the goal and work together yes. toward it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And cultivate a meaningful relationship in the process. That sounds like the meaning of life, Constantine. <laughs> 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 thank, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Before we let you go, do you have a project in the works that you can talk about that you'd like to let our listeners know about? Now we are just uh, four or five months away from the Milan Furniture Fair, which is still the the most important event uh, every year for showing new work for my practice. And uh, four or five months away from that um, means we are really in the final stages of a handful of projects that are, uh, are going to be launched. There, the usual clients that are Magis and Planck, a Spanish company called Ketal. And then we are doing a, a, an exhibition that's going to open in in Rome, in Italy, in, in, in February. Uh, it's an exhibition on curating and designing, uh, an exhibition about architecture, a certain point of view about architecture. I was free to choose works from the archives of the Maxi Museum. Maxi is the Museum of Contemporary Art and Architecture in Rome, built by Zaha Hadid, um, famous for that. Uh, mm-hmm. They have a collection, an architectural archive and collection, and I've, I've been able to kind of go into that archive and choose and, and find a project. And I've came across four amazing architects. Uh, three of them I, I hadn't known, uh, Italian architects from the 60s and 70s, that are kind of utopian architects, people that uh, in their time, um, they, they kind of looked at the future um, in a very optimistic way and yeah. and and really believed that the, the impossible was possible uh, and absolutely incredible to see what you know these visions and ideas were in terms of i mean in a formal way but also in terms of scale in terms of futuristic um, vision of what cities are becoming and you know they were really working on grand scale projects um and I have to remind you, without computers, that was and and <laughs> really on the drawing board, but but with the the kind of it's all about imagination, their their ideas um, that they were able to bring to paper into models, and some of these projects were even built. And I I, I discovered some of these incredible projects uh, in in their archive, and and we are uh, designing a. Uh, a small exhibition, but but very, um, it's going to be very interesting. And 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 just that the process of kind of curating this exhibition alone has taught me so many things. And again, is now encouraging me um, to to even you know you know here I am in 2020, and we have so many you know so many more tools and in a way opportunities today than they had and let's use all of that for and and be be really you know forward looking and positive and imaginative um maybe you can hear in my voice i'm i'm really enthusiastic about this project yes. <laughs> and uh, and and of course being the not only curator but also designer of the exhibition my exhibition design the fact how we, the, the you know the, the way in which we we are displaying presenting these projects had to be somehow adequate to what they had done and um, just to give a little um, kind of kind of hint to what this exhibition is going to be i'm commissioning a, a digital artist people that work for the film industry mainly um so-called matte painters uh, i'm commissioning one of those painters to produce a, a huge picture like a billboard size picture um, a, a visualization of a utopian landscape incorporating some of these built and unbuilt projects from these architects so uh, in, in the exhibition in a way we are if only with a, with a with a picture we, we want to kind of realize something of what was their vision by means of a, a huge, a very, very kind of hyper-realistic picture, painting, rendering. It's going to be quite, quite amazing, I think, um, and very exciting. 
we we will be sure to include links to that. Yes, um, um, yeah, it, it will soon be announced, uh, and and the date is the fifth of February. Um, that's when the exhibition starts, and at the Maxi uh, Museum in Rome. Well, congratulations on that, and we'll be excited to see all of your new furniture projects in Milan. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks, Amy. It's, yeah, it's been it's been lovely. It's been really nice uh, talking to you. Thanks for listening and uh, and and for making this conversation uh, so so easy. Hey, thanks for listening. To see images of Constantine's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for Clever's newsletter. If you haven't already, subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would, please rate and review. It really does help a lot. We also love chatting with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is created and produced by me, Amy Devers, along with Jamie Derringer. Our production company is 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.